Speaker, you're doing a great job of that today. Being very social distance. Well, I just want to make an announcement. Today will be my last Sunday here uh, because Pastor McReynolds is going to be starting next week. I, I think it's kind of like a, uh, you know, when you open a brand new store, you you open and your public comes in and they're part of the, coming to the store, and then you have your grand opening. So, so Pastor McReynolds will actually officially start preaching for us next Sunday, and uh, then he'll be installed later on in the month of September. But that's okay. That's just the, the liturgical ritual of insulation. But it certainly has been a pleasure being here with you all, and uh, I'm really excited about today's message. Uh, today's message ties in all three of the lessons today. We have, uh, so you say, we're going to have three readings today? Yes. Yes, we are. Uh, we're going to have all three lessons. Why? Because I'm preaching on all three lessons today. So they're all very relevant, and we need to have them read. Uh, what we're going to hear primarily uh, is the prophet Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. And why was he a weeping prophet? Because his ministry was so challenging and so difficult. He had to go around and tell people to repent, to turn from their sin. You know, and who wants to hear that? So his ministry was so hard. And he became very frustrated. And you'll hear that in the lesson today. And, and then in our epistle lesson, Paul gives us um, a formula on how to endure times of despair like Jeremiah was going through. And then Peter today in our gospel lesson, I mean, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. So you want to talk about having a bad day. Have Jesus quiet Satan. So when I read all those lessons in preparation for the message today, I thought, man, that sounds like uh, uh, dealing with afflictions like we're doing today. You know, when you look around us, I mean, you can't turn on the news for five minutes and say, oh my goodness, right? What's going on in our world, in our country, between, between all of the violent protesting going on in the cities, right, and, and COVID-19, and now we've got these hurricanes coming up from the Gulf and bringing destruction. And so how timely was the, is the message for today? Patience in, in our tribulation and affliction. That's where we're at. And I pray that today's services will help you to find that patience and strength that you need to walk out these doors knowing that in Christ, in Christ in you, you can handle it all. And we probably have about 10,000 reasons to uh, get excited. And we're going to hear about that today. So let's stand in a sing some songs. All right, we got to start our service. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
come here to do? We come to be in the presence of God, to draw close to Him and worship Him. And we desire to be filled with the joy of forgiveness, the joy of, of being set free from the bondage of guilt. So now in the quiet of our minds, let's come to the Lord and confess our sins between our hearts There's no greater joy in knowing that our sins have been paid for by the blood of Christ on the cross. And that we can bring any sin, no sin's too great. And we know that whatever we do, Jesus will say, I love you, I forgive you. And as a called ordained pastor, I proclaim, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson this morning is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 15, verses 15 through 21. O Lord, you know. Remember me and visit me and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your forbearance, take me not away. Know that for your sake I bear reproach. Your words were found, and I ate them. And your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. I did not sit in the company of revelers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone, because your hand was upon me. For you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Will you be to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail? Therefore, thus says the Lord, If you return, I will restore you, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth. They shall turn to you, but you shall not turn to them, and I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, declares the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson for today is from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably 
with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 16th chapter, verses 21 through 28. Glory be to thee, O Lord. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Yet behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the gospel of the Lord. Well, now affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Peter. Powerful words we've heard in the songs already this morning. Right? Of how God is there when we're, when we're going through some tough times. And I, I, I can't remember any times that are tougher than the times we're in right now. I mean, these are, these are tough times, at least in my lifetime. I know, I mean, over history, there's been all kinds of difficult times, but these just seem to be, at some points, overwhelming. And, and, and what I want us to really focus on is that God is with us, that God does love us, and God has a plan that if we follow that plan, we can endure all things. And it really, the plan is found in our key verse today, so let's read that key verse out loud together, Romans 12, 12. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. That's pretty clear. I mean, that's so easy. It's easy to write it, easy to say it, but hard to do. You know, when you look around and you see so many people, they just seem to be in a, in a darkness of despair, almost like a hopelessness. And, um, they don't know what's going to be next. The chaos is so overwhelming them. And, and the reality is, even no matter if it, if it seems dark and gloomy by the forecast of what's happening in the world, we know that the light of God's love breaks through that. That Christ is with us, and He's got a plan for us. That's what this outline hopefully will help us to see God's plan and give us strength to endure. Now, i got to warn you, my sermon is different today than it normally is. If you, if you take your bulletin and open it up and look at the inside cover, there's the outline. And I know that my tradition has been three points with three sub-points in each point, nine Bible verses, and the heck, it's the last time I'm going to preach for a while. Let's just shake it up a little bit. Let's bring a little bit, a little change. I, I caught our tech people off guard a little bit on that. So just follow along. There's two main points. Each main point has two sections or two subsections. It's like, my goodness. Okay, we're going to do it. We will survive. Just hang on, follow along, and hopefully it will be meaningful to you. All right. First section, patient in affliction does not walk away, but remains confident in prayer. In other words, we don't run away from affliction. We stay in it because we have prayer to give us the strength to handle our situation. In, 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 in our Old Testament lesson, we have Jeremiah. He's in affliction. And, and we're finding him in the middle of a prayer with God. He's, he's having communication with God. And the letter A says, Jeremiah's affliction could have overwhelmed him. And the people were awful. The people were calling him all kinds of names and, and threatening his life and, and just persecuting him in all kinds of ways. Well, let's take a look and see what he says to God here uh, in point one of this section. Jeremiah cries out to God in prayer. And in verse 18 of today's lesson, he says, Why is my pain unending and my wound grievous and incurable. Will you be to me like a deceptive brook, like a spring that fails? I mean, Jeremiah is talking to God here, right? And you can hear his heart. He's saying, God, you're letting me down. These people are just wearing, wearing me down to, I'm, I just don't know if I can go on. And I mean, Jeremiah wasn't the only prophet that the people got mad at. I mean, remember King Ahab during, during the time of, of the prophet Elijah. And Ahab said, well, I've got the exact quote here. You are the one who troubles Israel. Basically, these are the same words that the crowd was saying to Jeremiah. If it wasn't for you and all of that preaching of the law and calling people to repentance, there would be peace in the land. It's all your fault, Jeremiah. Really? But, you know, but, but here, poor Jeremiah, he's just a messenger, right? 
He's just bringing the message of God, calling for the people to turn from their sin. But yet the people just poured out their wrath on him. And, 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 and all of that, all of those accusations and all of that name calling against Jeremiah wore him down. I mean, when Jeremiah started his ministry, he, he found God's word to be comforting. That God's word was his source of strength. He could handle things because he, he fed on the word of God. And he felt God's presence with him. But the more people attacked him and the more pressure that came upon him, Jeremiah started looking inward to himself. And he's thinking, I can't do this anymore. But where was he looking for his strength? He had lost sight of where it came from. Our strength isn't in here. Our strength comes from God, right? It's it's the God connection. And and, and and when you think about it, how often does that happen to people? In in the darkness of their affliction, in in, in the midst of their suffering, they, they start to wonder, where's God? Why is he allowing this terrible affliction on me? This inner pain is disrupting the connection between the prophet and his Lord. And that happens to all of us too, I don't know. We go through these dark times, these, these dark valleys, and, and it's hard on us, and, and we lose sight of how much God loves us. But God doesn't give up on us. Let's look at the second point in this section. God responds to Jeremiah in steadfast mercy. Okay? In verse 20, here we hear God's response to Jeremiah's prayer of, of just sharing his pain with God. And, and God says here, I will make you a wall to this people, a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you. For I am with you to rescue and save you, declares the Lord. So God was saying to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, I haven't left you. Jeremiah, repent of your inward looking. Repent of trying to find your own strength to get the job done. Turn your mind around. I am, the, I am your Lord. I will rescue you. I will give you the strength that you need to get the job done. I mean, how many of you are going through your own little struggles or your own little challenges? Aren't we all? And here, God is saying to Jeremiah, I'm going to make you like a bronze wall. When you think about it, you know, during the time of Jeremiah, bronze, that was like the strongest metal they had. So I, I'm going to make you powerful. I'm going to make you to be able to withstand all the slings and arrows. You don't have to worry about all that stuff that people are saying about you and, and all, all of that that's been causing you despair. I will give you strength. I mean, isn't that how God's prophets always had to be? I mean, look at Apostle Paul in... in uh, in Corinthians, he says, when I am weak, then I am strong. Then he goes on a little later, we're going to look at it later on in our same, in the outline, we're going to see where Paul says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Paul, Paul understood suffering just as Jeremiah understood it. And God has given us these examples in the Bible so that when we're suffering, when we're in our dark valleys, when, when we're going through our struggles, we know that that's not unusual. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world that has, has nailed our Lord to the cross. So if the world <laughs> has rejected our Lord, how much more are they going to reject us? It shouldn't surprise us. These are tough times. And we need to know that, that God loves us. And he's there for us. See, with the Lord's help, 
we can overcome no matter what comes our way. You know, when we, when we get up and we see all this stuff that's going on, we look at the news and we see so many things that we know we couldn't handle, that we couldn't fix, but we know that our God can do all things. And we trust Him to get us through those things. It takes us to letter B in our outline here. Uh, we overcome our afflictions by clinging to God in prayer. So point one in this section says, God invites our prayers and gives us His Holy Spirit to help us pray. In Romans 8, 26, 27, it says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And He who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Let's think about what this means. When you're going through a dark time, when you're going through uh, a severe illness or a loss of a job or loss of a loved one or, or any kind of a very emotionally challenging, difficult time in your life, and you think, well, how should I pray? You know, I mean, our natural inclination would be, Lord, take this away from me. Lord, let me walk around this dark valley. I don't want to go through it. Right? That, but see, that might not be God's will for us. God might say, you're going to learn a lot of things in that valley. And the good news is, I will go through the valley with you. And see, that's why the Spirit is in us. So, so then these times when we don't know how to pray, or even know what God's will is for this moment in our life, we, we kind of just lift up our heart and let the Spirit connect us to God when we're too weak to handle it ourselves. Now that doesn't mean we shouldn't pray our own prayers. But we need to know that, that God is there for us. That He will make sure that we stay connected to Him. So important. And really we'll look at more let's look at point two of letter B. Our whole perspective can improve through prayer. In first Thessalonians five, sixteen to eighteen, the Apostle Paul wrote, Be joyful always. Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let's try to unpack it here. I mean, the Apostle Paul says so much in such short little lines. Let's start with pray continually. What does that mean? What does it look like? And here's the bottom line. It doesn't mean that we're going to spend 24 hours a day on our knees, hands folded, with our eyes up to heaven, in, in constant physical prayer. That's not what that means. What it's saying is stay connected to God continually. This is the key. This is why it's so important we come to church every week. So we come in and we confess our sins. We find forgiveness. We hear the words of the Bible read. We hear the words of the Bible preached. We partake of the sacrament on a regular basis. We're fed. The connection between us and God is solid. When the connection between us and God is solid, then we can be joyful always. Even in darkness. Even in the valley. Even when we're sick. Even when we're hit hurting. Even when there's chaos all around us. Even when there's a hurricane coming right up from the Gulf Coast. Joyful always. Now, see, it, it doesn't say in all circumstances. I mean, for all circumstances. It says in all circumstances. So no matter what the circumstance is, the joy of the Lord is with us. Right? No matter what's going on. I always say, you know, people say, well, under the circumstances, I'm doing pretty good. 
as a child of God, we're over the circumstances. Right? In other words, he gives us power to overcome all circumstances, all struggles, and we could always be joyful. One of my goals here has always been throughout my whole ministry is that when people come to church, that God's love and God's presence will fill their hearts with joy as we sing our praises, as we cling to his promises, and we gather with his people, right? That sounds like it could be almost a sermon, three points. But that's the idea. So that when we walk out, we're filled with the joy of the Lord. I, I always like to mess with people. I, I hope you would try this this week. When someone comes up to you and says, how are you? I want you to say, filled with with the joy of the Lord. Oh my, that is awesome. You know, because when you say that to people, they kind of go, really? I, I, I really like them when they say, well, well, why is that? I say, well, you got some time? Right? Because we are, we're all filled with the joy of the Lord. We're all forgiven. We've all been washed clean in the water of baptism. We all know that there's a Savior, Jesus Christ, who is willing to have us come unto him at any time and to bring our, our hurts, our struggles, our concerns. He said, come unto me. I'm here for you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And if that doesn't fill your heart with joy, having a relationship like that with Christ, I don't know what will. So that, that's the point, that we can endure all things, be thankful in all circumstances, because we have a God who loves us very much. All right, that's part one. Now we're going to part two. Okay, Part two is patience in affliction does not take control, but rejoices in hope. In other words, a lot of times we want to fix it. See, that, that's the taking control part. That's, a, that's not the plan. Remember, God's in control. He's the one that's going to rescue us. Look at letter A. This is a perfect example of that. The disciples in our gospel lesson demonstrated a lack of patience, especially Peter. Peter was that kind of guy. That's just how Peter was. So Jesus was telling, telling the disciples, well, I'm going to suffer and die. And Peter's thinking, what? Because Peter was so sure that Jesus would, had come to, to establish uh, heaven on earth, that this was going to be uh, a renewal of Jerusalem's power that going to be even greater than King Solomon and King David were there, that the Messiah had come and it was time for, for, for a new kingdom. And here Jesus is saying, I'm going to suffer and die. And so Peter pulls them aside and says, uh, Jesus, you don't want to do this. You don't, you don't want to do this. How do, what does Peter say in our verse here, Matthew 16, 23? He says, Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. How would you like Jesus to say that to you? I mean, can you imagine what Peter felt like? Here, Peter is like one of the inner circle, one of... It's like a Lord. But what actually, Peter was pretty much doing what Satan was trying to do when, when Jesus was in the wilderness. Remember the 40 days in the wilderness? And, and Satan came up to Jesus, was tempting him, trying to derail Jesus from his ministry? Well, that's what Peter was trying to do. He was trying to tell Jesus, no, no, you don't want to, you don't, you don't want to suffer and die. Don't do that the very reason he came. To be the Lamb of God. To go to the cross and pay the price for the sins of all mankind. Nothing could interfere with that ministry. And see, so what Jesus was trying to do was the same thing that, that God was trying to do for Jeremiah. To get the, the apostles and the prophets on the right page. To get their focus on the plan. Uh, that takes us to letter A, 2. Jesus opened their minds to the things of God. 
In Matthew 16, 24 to 25, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. For whoever loses his life for me will find it. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? And, and, and the reality is getting back on the right plan. What is the plan for our life? Too often people think um, their life is like a Milton Bradley board game. How many of you played Flight? Have you all played that game? Yeah. You remember it. You know, take your little car and you, you get married and then you get children. Well, probably you got your education first, right? Figure out what you're going to be. And then, then you get your children and then you go through life and you, and, and you try and find all the places where you can make the most money. And then you get to the end of the game and you check to see if you won or not. And the only score that mattered was how much money you made. And some people live that way. And there's nothing wrong with making money. That's a good thing. I mean, it's fine. It's a tool that God gives us to do, and we can do a lot of great things with money, and that's good. But it's not the goal of our life. The goal of our life is not to see how many things we can uh, uh, accumulate. The goal of our life is to have a living relationship with our Savior. The goal of our life is to know Him and love Him with all our heart and soul, strength and mind. And then to help others love Him that way by loving them. And, and so that, that's the plan. That's, that's trying, Jesus was trying to get people to understand that. To, he says, take up your cross and follow me. I'm going to show you what life is really all about. So we let her be here. We can find strength to carry our cross when we place our hope in Jesus. Now, see, that's, that's the important thing, that, that our strength doesn't come from within, but comes from our Lord. Let's look at point one in this section. The Apostle Paul is an excellent example of one who overcame his weakness and found strength in Christ. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Why is this so important? How do I find it? How can I do everything? From Him. So, if I'm facing a sickness, I can endure all sicknesses through strength in Him. I can overcome all the storms of life, the, the winds and the rain, and the, all the disaster that it brings through strength in Him. I can face the unknown face the future through strength in Him. So no matter what my affliction is, no matter if it's an illness or physical disaster or whatever, a family discord, when we have Christ, we can face all things. And that is so important. See, when Christ is in you and you are in Christ, you are connected, and His strength, His joy, His peace help you face any and all afflictions. And good news is, we're on the last point. You too. We can be patient by rejoicing in hope. And Romans 8, 31, 33 says, What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Here's how this works. Here's what Paul's saying. If God loved you enough to send his son to be born of the Virgin Mary, to grow up and live as a man, totally humbling himself, putting his divinity aside, and for 30 years living life on earth, enduring all the things that we have to endure, and then for three years doing ministry with disciples and the people around him, ultimately going to the cross, being nailed there for you, suffering the most excruciating way to die. I think 
I don't think there's anything worse than to be nailed to a cross where you can't hardly breathe. I mean, you're hanging there. You're, you're, uh, your lungs are being collapsed for the weight of your body. You've got to push up against the nails in your feet to try and breathe. Here's Jesus loving you that much and giving his life and his blood for you. Now, if Jesus was willing to do that, according to this verse, how much more is he willing to live for help you today? If he was willing to do all that suffering on the cross for you, then he's going to help you face whatever that affliction is you're going through. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He loves you unconditionally. And so as, as we prepare to wrap this whole thing up and think in our minds, God loves me. And that love will give me strength to face the troubles I have today. And I don't have to worry about tomorrow because that same love will be with me. And that love will be with me forever. Amen. And now may the peace of God which transcends all human understanding fill your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We go to our Lord in prayer. Please stand for prayer. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, we give you thanks and praise for your whole creation, but especially for your grace by which you invite all sinners into your saving presence through the cross and the resurrection of your Son. Give us all the power to turn in true repentance of our sin to receive your glorious promised forgiveness and gift of eternal life. Gracious Lord, bless the schools of the church and all colleges, universities, and centers of learning, and those who teach and work in them. Grant your wisdom in such measure that people may serve you honorably in church and state, and that our lives may be conformed to the ways of your truth. We pray for our faith and faithfulness, especially for those persecuted for the cause of Christ, and for our strength in time of trial and for us to persevere in grace in the day of trouble. We pray for Donald, our president, Asa, our governor, and all legislators and civil servants, for those who must render judgment and impose punishment upon lawbreakers, and for those who work for peace among the nations. We pray for, for all those who have suffered loss and from the storms this week, and we pray that Resources will be made available. Food, shelter, helping hand. We pray for favorable weather and for those who tend the soil and harvest its fruits. For business and industry, service workers and artisans. For generosity toward those in need. And for the unemployed and the underemployed. For those married, that they would live in fidelity to their vows and promises for parents as they teach their children to know and love the Lord, for a single adult that they may find fulfillment in their service to others, and for our lives together, showing the love of Christ to one another. For grace to take up the cross and follow the Lord wherever he leads, for courage in the face of challenge and adversity, and for compassion and harmony in our life together. And we pray for the sick, and the hurting. We pray especially for those who requested prayer. We pray for Clara Lassa and Glenn Peterson, Faye Adams, Ed Valent, Chad Coleman, Bonnie Cooper, Ron Shankowski, Bill Drive, Ken Dorman, Gert Dunlop, Lynn Enoch, Vern and Laura Esch, Pasquale Fioretti, Ellen Heafy, Tom Hedrick, Joyce Hitch, Chad Jennings, Wayne Jollyboy, Steve Garble, Eva Martin, Evelyn Meyer, Fran Nye, Marge Rosencotter, Sandra Schmidt, 
Frank Schneider, Hazel Schofester, David Schroeder, Ernestine Schultz, Betty Sensenbanek, uh, Delbert Schaefer, Mary Schnackle, Merle Stokelin, Stacy Fan, Jamie Spence, Judy Spade, Stan Stankus, Cynthia Titus, Joyce Alecki, and Ken Zippen. Lord, we lift these people up to you and ask for their healing in accordance with your will. And we pray for those who mourn. Uh, um, and for all those we mentioned in the quiet of our mind and for those who are suffering the loss. We pray, Lord, for people who have lost loved ones, that you would bring comfort and hope as they cling to the message of your gospel and the promises that you have given to comfort and encourage them. We pray for uh, remembrance of the saints and grace to follow their example of faith. We pray uh, that you would grant us a place with them in their fellowship and for our eternal life in God's kingdom without end. Almighty God, you have forgiven our sins and delivered us from death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Continue to pour out your mercy upon us and grant to us all good things needful to this body and life and keep from us all things harmful, and lead us in the special prayer to God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Please be seated and wait for the ushers to lead you out in a safe and healthy dismissal.